Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, I want to say good afternoon to those of you joining me here on the East Coast. It's just past 12 noon Eastern time. Of course, we want to say good morning to those of you joining us from the central time zones, the mountain time zones, or the Pacific time zones as well. I hope those of you in the and the Pacific Northwest aren't having too much problem with the windstorms that are coming up right now. And of course, we do want to say good evening to those of you who might be joining us from across the pond in parts of UK or parts of Europe. Well, welcome to today's presentation, Straddles and Strangles for Earnings. Uh, we're going to go over some of the basic details of straddles and strangles, the difference between them, and then of course also discuss some of the flaws, some of the issues as well, and some of the things to look out for. All right, now, before we begin, I just want to introduce what is Power Options. Well, Power Options is a patented suite of search and analysis tools designed for self-directed options investors. We support patented search tools, analysis tools, and portfolio tools uh, that support over 23 of the most commonly used option strategies. Of course, also long straddles, and long strangles, which we're going to focus on today. The Power Options tools were created by Ernie Zarenner back in 1997 to trade his own personal account. Um, of course, everyone here on Power Options uses these tools to trade their personal account, so we have many more years of combined trading experience. Now, the tools, as I mentioned, will allow you to find new trades using the patented search tool. We may take a look at that. We probably will take a look at that later on in the presentation. Uh, the powerful set of portfolio tools for tracking, managing, and evaluating rollout opportunities in your various positions. Of course, we have a virtual library of help videos, archived webinars, tutorials, and other education to help you get more familiar with the various option strategies and management techniques, as well as uh, the various tools on the site as well. Well, what we're going to cover today, as I mentioned, is sort of the basics of straddles and strangles. We're going to look at comparisons of the two, what to expect when entering a long straddle or a long strangle. We're going to cover the expectations of volatility and IV crush, of course, towards the end of the presentation after we go over some different examples. And then we're going to discuss, you know, the conclusion and our thoughts for what you might do for looking for a straddle and a strangle as well. All right, so what is the main difference? Very simple. On the left first here, a straddle consists of buying a call and buying a put at the same strike price and the same expiration date. It'll give you a V profit and loss chart. The expectation, of course, is you're expecting a wide swing in the underlying security in one direction or the other, you just don't know which. These are strategies, of course, that are used anytime we have earnings coming up, speculating on a wide movement one direction or the other, or if you're a little bit more bold and you're trading uh, the biotech stocks there, which will have a higher implied volatility and a much higher cost, but you're expecting something along the lines of, let's say, a phase two or phase three drug trial between now and the expiration of your position. The strangle is a very similar trade, but consists of buying a call and buying a put at different strike prices with the same expiration. The most common approach for a strangle is to buy an out-of-the-money call and an out-of-the-money put. For example, if we have a stock trading at $50 and earnings is coming up in two weeks, I may look to buy a 47 and a half strike put that's out of the money and at the same time buy a 52 and a half strike call. Naturally, I'm expecting a wide swing of about 8 or 10% one direction or the other after the earnings event. Now, the strangle gives you sort of a flat U profit and loss chart, and we'll take a look at that in just a moment. Now, going back, let's look at Delta Airlines. On October 11th, Delta Airlines was trading at $38.94, and we had earnings on October 13th. Now, how I might have entered a long straddle position is I may have bought a f November 4th expiration. So not the 14th of October necessarily, but the 4th of November expiration. For the straddle with a stock at 38.94, you typically would look to buy at the money options. Now we will we'll look a little bit later on on uh, discussing an in the money strangle or an out of the money, I'm sorry, an in the money straddle or an out of the money straddle. 
but in general, you want to keep it right at the money. So with the stock at 38.94, to enter a long straddle, I'd buy a 39 call, and the 4th of November series was priced at 137. Now at the same time, I'd buy a November 39 put at 152. Now my total invested would be 289 per contract, but the break-even value, of course, is going to be the investment amount plus the call strike price, so it would be at 41.89 for the upper break-even, and the lower break-even would be 36.11, 2.89 minus the 39 strike put. Now, if I was going to open a strangle instead, and why would I open a strangle instead? Well, it's because of the lower cost basis into the position. So I could look to buy a November 41 call. The stock's roughly at 39, so we're going two strikes out of the money, essentially. And this would only cost 62 cents. And at the same time, I'd buy a November 37 put, kind of keeping it equidistant, two strikes below, two strikes out of the money for the put for 74 cents. So my investment amount would only be $1.36, roughly half of what we would see on the straddle position. But because I'm using an out-of-the-money call and an out-of-the-money put, where the value won't kick in until the stock moves above the 41 strike or below the 37 strike where I start gaining intrinsically on the call or on the put, notice that the break-evens are wider. Even though my cost is less, my lower break-even is now 35.64. I need the stock to gap down to 35.64 to start realizing a profit. Of course, that's at expiration, but it's a static break-even. It's a fair comparison versus the straddle. And your upper break-even same equation, strike price of the call plus what I invested, but that would be 42.36. So again, we have a lower cost basis into the strangle, but we're going to have a wider range to hit break even on the position. Now, when we take a look at the, oh, sorry folks, that apparently did not want to show the graph there. Let me go back one here. Okay, so it, I apologize for that. It didn't show the straddle or the strangle, but I'll draw it out for you while we're here. So looking at our position, we had two profit and loss charts for our position. On the straddle, 31, you know the maximum loss would be what you invested into the position, in this case, 236. So if there was no movement, due to earnings, which can happen, I'll we'll take a look at an example of that in just a moment, you would stand to lose the full 236 times how many contracts you do. And we saw, of course, that our upper and lower break-evens at expiration would be the call strike price that we had plus the investment into the position. The call and the put, 31 strike. I'm sorry, the 39 strike, my apologies. So it would be 4136 on the upper break-even and level down here, we saw it at um, 36, okay, 63, I'm sorry, 64, okay. Now on the strangle, what you'd expect to see is, remember, we were looking at a 37 strike put and a 41 strike call, and so what we'd expect to see here is more of the flat profit and loss chart on our position, where the break-evens now would be our put strike price minus our investment. We saw we had that wider range to upper and lower break-even, or in this case here, it'd be at 42, I believe 36 as well. Okay, so that's the difference. The V-shaped profit and loss chart, which gives you a closer range to the upper and lower break-even versus the U profit and loss chart as well. Now, that is a basic introduction, as basic as can be, and I don't know why the slides weren't there. They were there earlier today. I don't know why the images didn't show up. But when we're talking about a straddle and strangle, this raises a lot of questions. We know that we want to select an expiration date for the call and the put and the straddle or the strangle. That's, of course, after the earnings. wouldn't want to buy a straddle or strangle before the earnings. That wouldn't do us any good. We're banking on this event to cause a large swing in the position to realize a profit. Now, which strike price is the best? Should straddles always be at the money? 
And what do we know about options? Well, anytime you look at any option chain, the at-the-money options, strike prices that are closest to the current stock price, are going to have the highest time premium of all other options in that series. So you might say, is it better to buy a straddle? And we were talking about the DAL position, oh, sorry folks, the DAL position at 31, I'm sorry, 38.94. And we looked at buying the 39 strikes, the at the money strikes. Well, some investors feel that you might do better buying either an in the money straddle, meaning against the call, where I might buy a 37 call and a 37 put that's out of the money, which is very cheap. Okay? Well, the thing is, is that now you're speculating on something else. You're speculating on a direction. If my stock was at 39 and I bought the 37 call and put as an in-the-money straddle, well, I'm expecting now the stock's really going to swing to the downside. If I have that strong of an expectation, I probably just want to buy a put, is my opinion. And, you know, going in the money, buying, let's say, a 41 strike call and a 41 strike put, where our 41 put is in the money, we're banking on a different directional trade. So we'd rather probably do one direction or the other as well. Now, how far apart do we set the strangle? Well, we're going to see that in the examples. That's really going to come down to the value, of course, or I should say the range of your expectations for the movement. If you decided to trade a straddle or strangle on Apple, it's because you're expecting a wide move, either based on past earnings events, past swings, or just your feeling of the market itself in general, okay? So if I'm looking at a strangle on Apple and I set my call strike 10% out of the money and my put strike 10% out of the money to get into a cheaper position, well, then I'm going to need at least a 10%, probably a 12 or 15, probably a 12% movement in order to realize a profit on the position. Okay, because it needs to cover that range to where the call and the put can go in the money and counter the cost you paid into the position. So at best expectation, if you're thinking that an 8 or 10% movement on the stock is reasonable and you're looking to do a strangle to have the lower cost, you probably only want to go 5% out of the money at most with the call and the put strike. Okay, now other things that we have to look for, of course, is the IV crush. As we all know, we're not the only ones that know that earnings is coming up. The market as a whole knows that earnings is coming up as well. And so what we expect to see is an increase in implied volatility as we get closer to earnings. Now this can be a pitfall because if the options implied volatility is too high, what do I mean by too high? Double the options that are surrounding it, or double what its average implied volatility range is for the options surrounding it, that means you can expect a large crush on the position. This means you may even see an 8 to 10% movement in one direction or the other if you're in a straddle or strangle, and you still might not make a profit. Now, Steve's asked the question, what if the price does not move at all? Won't we lose our total investment? Well, that's what we're going to look at with the examples, okay? We're going to show one example here. We're going to talk about Delta Airlines again. We're going to show some different series and some different examples. We're also going to look at Alcoa. And I'm going to show you one of my positions as well. And we're going to talk about how to avoid losing all of your investment. But again, it, there, there is that potential, Steve, but it depends on which expiration you select. And it depends on your outlook for the stock, of course, as well, and what your range of break-even are. All right, so in the, the previous example I showed, which was a terrible profit and loss chart, and in fact, I'm going to go back one second here. All right, let's go back a few slides. I want to make sure you all see this. Okay, here is, remember, what our straddle for Delta would have been with the November for 39 call at 137 and the 39 put at 152, okay? Now, what I'm going to do very quickly, I, I do apologize again, I can see the slide coming up next and it shows the graphs there, I don't know why it didn't appear. 
So let me go ahead and switch screens. We're just going to jump into power options very, very quickly. Okay, let's see. there it is. Okay, so let me go into the custom spread tool real quick. And we're going to take a look at DAL. Yes, earnings have already passed for our position. But what I want to do is take a look at that strangle we would have bought. So let's go to the 4th of November. And we were talking about using the 39 call and the 39 put. Remember, this was on October 11th prior to the earnings event. And we're going to pay 137 for the call option, and we were going to pay 152 for the put option. Okay. Now, in relation to Steve's question, if the stock didn't move, couldn't we lose the entire value? Well, remember, the earnings came out for, for Delta Airlines on October 13th. Okay, it came out yesterday. Now, had I bought the October 14th expiration series, and the stock did not move, and it stayed right at 39. In fact, it didn't move much at all. We're going to go over that. We're going to show you different examples of spread, uh, straddles and strangles, my apologies, Steve, on DAL. Okay? But notice here on the profit and loss chart, the curved red line, even right now, you know, halfway between now and my expiration of November 4th, my loss would only be 143, about half of the 289 because there's still expected to be some time value remaining. There was a volatility crush, a little bit. When we opened this position, the IV of uh, the DAL call and the DAL put were around 0.37 for the call, 37% for the call, and about 34, 35% for the put. Okay, so now they're both at about 0.299. So there was a little volatility crush, but the position isn't near full loss because I didn't set the expiration date to October 14th. We're going to show that in a moment on the slides as well. But this is what you'd expect with a straddle. And remember, we have our break even at 36.11 to the downside and 41.89 to the upside, static at expiration. Now let's change it to our strangle for a better view. And on the strangle, I would have bought the out-of-the-money positions for the November 4th expiration. And when the stock was at 39, I would have looked to purchase the 41 call, and that would have cost us about 62, 63 cents. We would have bought the 37 put for about 74. Okay, so let's take a look at our strangle position using the profit and loss chart here. So now remember, our total investment was 136. And as you mentioned, Steve, if the stock was not near that upper or lower break even, we'd have a loss. But if it stays between the two strike prices and I hold it all the way to November expiration, I can lose the full 136, which is, by the way, less than we saw we'd be losing right now on October 26 with the straddle if the stock stayed right at 39, at the halfway point. Okay? So the stock stayed at 39 for our strangle position. We see here we'd expect a loss of 110. Of course, the volatility is implied. Volatilities are about the same as well. So you get that U-shaped profit and loss chart, but we get that wider break even with the strangle because it has to cover, has to move above our call strike price or move below our put strike price before the intrinsic value kicks in and we start realizing a profit on the position. Okay? So can you lose everything on both of them? Yes, in an extreme example, if the stock does not move, you can. But it also depends on what you use as your selection process for the expiration date. And we're going to take a look at that in just a moment as well. All right, so let's navigate back over to our slide presentation. Okay, uh, Mike says, where's the put line in your graph? Let's see here. It actually, it just truncated, that's all. It truncated here because of the wide range. So we'd start to see this go up like this. And we know that our lower break even again would be our put strike price, the $37, minus the 136. So we'd be seeing that at around 35.64. Okay, so that would be 35.64. Just happened to truncate because it tried to put in all of the dollar strike differences for the DAL position. 
Okay, normally you don't see that, and we'll take a look at that, Mike, when we look at the other positions that we're going to look at when we uh, evaluate implied volatility as well. Okay. So let's, as I mentioned, navigate back over now. All right. There we go. Okay. So taking a look now, we talked about the IV crush, and we're going to get more in-depth, believe me, into that in a little bit. Now, but let's talk about DAL again. On October 13th, after earnings, remember, we were looking at the stock when it was trading at 38.94, and the stock gapped up to about $40.50 after the earnings. Okay, this was only about a 4.5% move, but it closed at $40. Okay, so we had about a $1.06, $1.05 gain in the stock, roughly about 4%. Now, for that straddle at the 39 strike, remember we invested 289. The liquidation was 270. Well, our 39 call went up to 180. We still had some time value remaining on it, but the put dropped down to 90. So it would have given us 270, and we would have had a loss of 11 cents, even with the 4, 4.5% movement on the position. Now, the strangle fared worse, didn't it? We had a lower cost at 136. And even though we did, you know, bought the 41 call, we paid less into it, that 41 call, which still is out to November 4th, would have been only 79 cents. And the put option, our 37 put, went down about 34 cents. So we'd have a loss of 23 cents, essentially double what we had on the straddle. So we would have paid twice as much to get into the straddle, but would have had a lower loss on the position. And, of course, with the strangle, we paid half the price. We would have had a larger loss because those options didn't react because we probably went close to 5 or 6% out of the money, but the stock only moved 4% with the movement. Now, why is there no profit? The reaction to earnings was only 4%. That's not enough for a significant gain. We were talking about opening a position on October 11th for earnings that were coming out on October 13th. We could have bought the October 14th straddle or strangle, so maybe we paid too much for that November 4th expiration. Would the closer series have worked better, or would the farther out series work better as well? And did we buy in too late? Should have we bought the straddle or strangle three or four weeks ago? You know, we did have an IV movement. The IV changed slightly, as I mentioned, from 0.35 to 0.29 for the calls and an average of about 0.375 to about 0.33, or 37.5% to 33% for the puts. Okay? Now, that seems like a minimal amount, but it will probably affect your cost going forward enough to where what might have been a 2 or 3 or maybe even a 10% profit. Now, I paid $1.36 into the strangle. If I made 14 or $0.15, cents, that's basically nothing, but you know, it's about a 10% gain if you think about it. But this change in volatility might be enough to counter that, as minimal as it seems. All right. Well, let's take a look. Same situation. On October 11th, Delta Airlines is trading at 38.94. If we look to do the straddle with the 39 strikes, it would have only cost us $1.56 compared to the 2.89 for the November 4th series. It was 75 cents for the call, 81 cents for the put. Now, the liquidation, the close of October 13th, after the earnings when the stock was around $40 per share, was 110 Actually, the call went up to 106 but Remember, the stock's at $40.01 at the close. It's right at intrinsic value. Okay, so this $0.75 cents of time value we paid in, we get that back, but it's all because of the intrinsic gain. The put essentially goes to zero. Now, that's the problem was selecting a straddle or strangle that might be too close the day after or the week after the earnings. If you don't get any movement, your options just go right to intrinsic value, essentially zero and essentially this. And if that movement was too small, we have a loss now on our straddle for today's expiration, which would have been 46 cents. This is about a third of our investment. It's about a 33% loss, and it's four times the loss that we would have had on the November series. Remember the November 4 series we paid 289, we would have had an 11 cent loss on the position. Okay? Here we're looking at a loss of 46, so it's almost four times that. The near term strangle did not fare any better. 
Okay, the total investment would have been 36 cents. So earlier this week, if I bought the 37 put and the 41 out of the money call, it would have been 17 cents for the call, 19 cents for the put, be an investment of 36 cents, but the stock didn't move enough. It's nowhere near our call strike price, nowhere near our put strike price, so we can liquidate for about 5 cents, which is a 31 cent loss on the strangle. And I have a note here, it says about 35% more. Remember the loss on the November 4th strangle was 23 cents. Okay? And the loss on that strangle if you think about it, 31 cents versus 23 is about 35 cents more. It's 8 cents more, which represents about a third more than the loss that we had on the farther out strangle. Okay, but farther out means only 14 more days, doesn't it? We're talking about the 4th of November compared to October 14th. So, what's the takeaway? Was the shorter term series cheaper? Absolutely. Remember, we paid $1.36 for the November 4th strangle with the same strikes, we would have paid 289 for the November 4th series. But the losses were lower further out because these options just went straight to intrinsic value, essentially worthless, because we did not get the movement that we wanted to. Okay? Now, where do we go from here? Well, of course, the other explanation, other comparison is what if we did the farther out series? What if I did a 39 straddle for January, same strike strangle? Well, naturally, my prices are going to triple. The straddle would have cost us 551, and the liquidation after earnings with a 4% movement is only 425. So that would have been a loss of 116. And on the strangle, a 366 investment, a liquidation value of 266 after the October earnings, so we would have had a loss of a dollar. Higher money in, higher money loss. However, what is the one thing that I can do with the January series that I've kind of pressured on if I bought the November 4th, and I possibly can't do if I bought the October 14th? Well, now we have another 100 plus days, about 100 days, to continue to manage this strangle that moved against us. Okay? With, if I bought the October 14th series, it was a hit or miss trade, wasn't it? We paid so much less into the position but without the movement, we take the loss, okay? And at the same time, by buying in January, if I have earnings coming out on Delta Airlines on October 13th, we can come close to an assumption that I'm also going to have earnings on January 12th or January 13th, so I have this position already in place where I might cross another earnings, even though it's showing me the higher loss right now. But is that what you're looking to do. Well, everyone has their own approach to it. Now, we talked about the different series and we saw the comparison. Buying shorter term, the options expire right after the earnings event or the closest weekly expiration to the earnings event, can realize the larger losses if you don't see the movement. Because the calls and the puts are essentially going to go to zero on the strangle if there's not enough movement, and one of your options on the straddle is going to go to zero, and the other one's just going to gain intrinsically. By going two or three weeks out in time from the earnings event, you're still retaining some time premium. Even if there's a lowering of implied volatility, you're still keeping some premium in play, so you're not seeing as large of a loss. Of course, if you go further out, you got to pay more in, and as we saw, we take the largest losses there further out in time, but we have much more time to manage the position. So, now that we've talked about the different expirations, did we buy in too late? Okay, Maybe we should have gone three or four weeks in advance to get into the straddle or strangle on the position. But now this requires planning, or of course a patented search tool where you can find positions where earnings are coming out in the next three to four weeks, but still match the cost basis and the criteria you're looking for. And another trick that's difficult with this is that the comparison is going to be different, isn't it? Because if I was opening a straddle or strangle as we saw on October 11th, well, the stock was at 38.94. I was going to buy the 39 call and the 39 put for the straddle. And we talked about the 41 call and the 37 call for the put. But if I go back to September 19th, the situation is different. On September 19th, about four weeks before the earnings date on October 13th, 
Delta Airlines was trading at 3757. So I likely would not have done the 39 straddler strangle for October 14th expiration. We would have looked at the 38. So on September 19th, the 38 straddle for the expiration and the earnings coming up would have been 267. The stock, of course, had moved up. We're at the 38, it goes up to 40. But again, because we're using the shorter term, we see a 205 value on the call, basically intrinsic, and only a three cent value on the put, it's gone to zero. So we're looking at a loss of 59 cents. And the strangle as well, it did not move enough. We would have gotten the 39.37, the stock roughly at 37.57. The total investment would have been 180, and we're looking at a loss of 77 cents or a value of 103 at expiration. Okay, now, I can't show you a comparison on Delta Airlines from September 19th using the November 4th series because it wasn't released yet. But it is interesting that the standard expiration on November 18th, the same straddle using the 38 strike, would have resulted in a higher loss of about a dollar for each position, where before we were looking about 59 cents and 77 cents, standard November expiration had a higher loss for those positions. Okay? So this was not a matter of timing or implied volatility. It was simply the effect of the stock not moving too much. So here's the first main key, other than what I talked about already, about when you're selecting a strangle, okay, you want to look for a position that you feel is probably going to swing at least 8% or so. All right? Because without that movement, the straddle of the strangle won't be as profitable. Now it's a trade-off, isn't it? Most straddles or strangles, you're going to need a movement of about 8% or so. It doesn't matter if you choose the one-week-out series, the four-week-out series. Because the market's going to factor in those cost bases, you are going to see implied volatility even on a larger cap stock or mid-cap stock, uh, such as uh, Delta Airlines, that have a high liquidity. Okay? So you're going to need a stock. You have to have the expectation that it's going to move more. Okay? Now let's talk about management of a losing position. Straddles and strangles, how do I want to phrase this? They're not a wealth option. Okay, if you're setting up a portfolio to profit consistently just during earnings season, and that's when you're doing all of your trades with various straddles and strangles, I don't think you're going to profit long term. I just don't. With the implied volatility crush and with the stocks needing, you need those stocks. The basket of stocks needs to be larger, those stocks that move at least 8% or so from the earnings event you're going to have losers, okay? And so you have to talk about what are you going to do to manage a position? Well, it depends on your structure. Now, from what I just showed you, we saw how the October 14th series, even though it was cheaper, had a larger loss after earnings when the stock didn't move that much. The 4th of November, which was, you know, 14, 20 days out from when the earnings were released, had a lower loss because it still retained some time value as to what you put into the position. But I'm not saying necessarily that it's a bad idea to use the shortest term and the closest in series for a straddle or strangle. I'm going to take a look at that in Alcoa in just a minute. But if I had opened the straddle or strangle for October 14th, I'm in a bind. There's no real management I can do on that position. When the earnings came out yesterday, I could have maybe tried to sell a call quickly to create a debit spread or a credit spread, but I wouldn't have gotten anything because all the options now are essentially an intrinsic value. It's not going to give me much gain to convert into a double diagonal with one day left expiration or an iron condor by selling a now at the money or out of the money call or put. And that might also increase uh, your range of margin as well. So you're probably going to have to close it and just look for a new position. Okay? Like I said, and Steve had mentioned, you stand to lose it all. And if you use the shorter term expiration cycles, you are looking for a hit or miss trade. Now, on the positions for November 4th, okay, since I still have a few weeks left to go to expiration, I can now manage either that 39 straddle or the 37 and 41 strangle. Okay, how might I look to do that? Well, right now, we could probably sell the October 24th with a stock at $40. We might be able to sell a, let's say, a 38, 39 strike put 
and maybe sell a 41 strike call. Well, we can't sell a 41 call, I apologize. Uh, but we could convert it into sort of an iron condor or a double diagonal, try to generate premium to hedge the loss. But that also has to depend on what your expectation is. So Delta Airlines popped up only 4%, and then it kind of pulled back. If I'm expecting it to continue to pull down after the earnings pop, well, I'm going to probably take a bearish side to the play. I right, might convert our call, whether it's the 39 call, of course, or whether it's the uh, stock at $40 now, I might look to sell a 41 strike call for this week's expiration or next week's expiration or November 4th to try to help me hedge some of that loss. Okay? So based on the direction, I think the position is going to go. And if I'm bullish, of course, and the stock had moved up and I consider it to go forward, we might create a bull call debit spread against the call. I don't know if you try to do a bull put credit spread uh, on the position with a higher strike put. And as I mentioned, if you're looking for the positions further out, of course, you might want to go beyond the next earnings. Okay? So here's just a review of what we talked about. Let's say that I had that straddle position with the uh, 37 put and the 41 call, and now our stock's trading at 40. Okay, so if bullish, I could create a calendar call spread, right? I could sell the 41 strike call for October 21st or October 28th expiration. I could do it for October 21st and then the 28th, and then maybe it spread for the 4th with a higher strike call to help hedge the loss. You could also do a calendar put spread in that sense, which would create a double diagonal depending on what you were willing to increase on your margin requirements. And again, most importantly, your expectations going forward. You could create just the condor of that, and now perhaps you could adjust the call if you're bullish. Now, the stock didn't move up too much. We really have no value in that call, but we could maybe roll it up to a higher strike price if we had enough of a move to do that or adjust the put as well. So management inside, once it has a loser, if you still have time remaining, that gives you a farther opportunity to continue to manage the position. But in this situation, where the stock moved up to 40 and there's not much value left in the strangle, in the 37 put, it'd be hard to kind of create a spread using the put um, in that scenario. Still have some value in the call that you might be able to manipulate also. Of course, now in our other comparison, why did I use the January? It was the biggest loser rather than the standard November 18th expiration or December. Because if I'm going to go further out in time and I'm going to pay for the extra time premium, I'm going to set a date that actually crosses the second earnings. Okay, but we'll, we'll, there's two approaches to this. If I'm expecting a subtle movement, but I don't know which direction with earnings coming up, this is when I would use this approach. If I'm expecting a 5 or 6% gain, but I have a long-term bullish or bearish approach on the position, this is when I would use those farther out-in-time series. Why? Because I can still take advantage of crossing the next earnings event. And after earnings come out, if the stock only moves one direction or the other, we can close one side and continue to manage this position as either a calendar spread or a single option spread as well. Or we could liquidate and move both options in to the November series and have a lower cost basis and see if that works to our advantage as well. All right, now let me talk about a quick example, very quick. I'm not going to go through all the details. We're actually going to do that on a second presentation. But here's a quick example of a failed strangle. Okay, on August 8, 2016, Fossil, FOSL, was trading at 30.74. Earnings were coming out on August 10th. Now, the stock was depressed. I like this stock. I mean, at one point, it had been close to $100 per share, about a year and a half, maybe more ago. I think it was around $90 or so. But the stock had been falling, and it's depressed, and I was hoping for an earnings jump one direction or the other. Now, looking at it, the last couple earnings did have a movement of about 6 or 7%. So I wasn't really confident that I was going to see that 8 or 10% movement in the underlying that I was expecting to see. So I ended up buying a December 32 call at 385. Right, so this was on August 8th. I'm going out about four months, four and a half months, and we bought the December 32 call at 385 and the December 29 put at 340. So my total investment was 725. 
Now again, why did I choose December? Because it would allow me to cross through the November expiration series if the stock does not do what I wanted to. Okay, so if I just bought the October, it would not be a hit or miss trade, but I'd have less time. Okay, so going out here, I can at least still go through November earnings if this doesn't work out the way I want. Now the most annoying thing, this position is one of the most annoying things I've ever seen on a Straddler Strangle I've traded, to be honest with you. So earnings came out on October 10th after the market close. And after hours trading, watching it, Fossil moved up 10% by 4.40 p.m. So it was trading at around $32.80, $33. It had moved up the 10%. And by projections, even with slight volatility shift, I was in a position to make about 25 to 30% on the strangle. Now, by 5 p.m., the after hours trading was only up 1%. So it rocketed up because of the earnings announcement, and then before the market even opened, it was back down to only 1% gain, and the morning of August 11th, the stock was only up 2% at open. So I had seen the potential for profit in after hours trading when I couldn't do anything, and then saw nothing. And of course, at the end of the day, the stock did close up 4.5%, but again, just as we saw with the Delta Airlines position, that wasn't enough of a movement for profit. So did I close the position and take the loss? No, I've been going with the stock and doing calendar call spreads when the stock looks like it's in a bullish pattern and calendar put spreads when it looks like it's bearish, keeping those same two strikes in place, uh, but selling out-of-the-money calls and occasionally out-of-the-money puts against it to lower the cost basis of my entire position. I have, haven't qu cut it quite in half yet, uh, but the position is only a value now of about 390 total invested and I've got earnings coming up in the next couple of weeks. All right, so why did I spend the first 35 minutes or so talking about a losing spread? Two losing spreads, really, where the stock didn't move enough to point out the simple fact that not every straddle or strangle is going to be profitable, even with a directional movement. Steve earlier had asked, can't you stand to lose the entire thing on the strangle if it doesn't move? Absolutely. We can also expect to lose the full amount on your straddle if it doesn't move as well. And how often do we see stocks not move at all because of an earnings event? Well, Fossil was one of them. <laughs> right after the earnings, the morning after the earnings announcement, that didn't end up happening. It only moved up around 1%. It wasn't enough. So if I had done a shorter term straddle for August expiration with only that 1% move at the open, I would have been at full loss. Even with the 4.5% gain, gain by the close, that August spread would still be at a loss position. It would not have been a gain. Okay? We also wanted to show that the time of expiration might not matter. We showed how all of the positions were going to show a loss on the Delta Airlines, whether you chose the nearest term expiration with the lowest cost, whether you went out a couple weeks to still retain some time value, where you went far out to a different December or January series, it still would be a loss. IV will have a great effect on a position. We're going to show that in just a little bit on power options. But the key is, is that most important, without the proper movement, when you're doing a straddle or strangle, you're going to need that 8% or more movement in order to profit. Okay, almost regardless of how far apart or how close in you set the strikes of the strangle or where you set the straddle and what expiration date you use. Okay? And we have to plan for that. You have to plan on an exit strategy and a management technique going forward when you open any straddle or strangle. Okay, so if the stock does have a 10 plus percent movement, most at the money straddles will be successful. Reasonable strangles will be successful. Now the shorter time frame options are going to have the higher IV crush. The ones closest to the expiration date of your earnings are going to have the highest IV crush. And what do I mean by reasonable strangles? If I look for a cheap strangle that's too far out of the money, it's not going to be profitable, even with a 10 or 15% movement, because both your options are going to go to zero if you don't see enough. All right, let's take a look at another quick example here with some other comparisons, and then we'll jump into that volatility discussion. They say that earnings season starts with Alcoa. Now, earnings came out on 10-11, and the stock did drop the 10% the 11% that we wanted, okay? After earnings on October 11th, the stock fell 360. Now let's look at some quick numbers from the straddles and strangles if we had opened them on October 7th, okay? 
Now, I have to use October 7th in this example because, as many of you might know, Alcoa had a 1 to 3 reverse split on October 5th. So the prices were $10, $10.06, $11 coming up to the earnings on October 11th, and on 10.7, the stock was priced at $30. Okay, so we're going to take a look at October 7th going into earnings on October 11th. Now, since, of course, the earnings date is on October 11th, the closest expiration we could choose is for today. With the stock at 31.37 on October 7th, we could have entered into the 31 strike straddle. That's why I got confused earlier when I was talking to Steve about the $31. That was for the Alcoa example, not for our $39 with uh, Delta Airlines. On October 7th, today's straddle with a 31 strike for Alcoa would have cost $1.94. 114 for the call, which is about 14 cents in the money, and 80 cents for the put, which was out of the money. Now, the day after earnings, or the day of earnings on October 11th, we could have liquidated the position for 308. Why? Well, we saw earlier that the stock dropped down the 10%, 11% we were looking for by 360. So our put was about $3 some in the money. So we could liquidate the position and we'd have a gain of 114 or 59% on the position. Okay? Now, well, the stock at 31.37 might have done a 32.30 strangle. I also might have done a 32.31 strangle, but let's stick with the 32.30 strangle. Our investment would have been 112, 69 cents for the out of the money call, 43 cents for the out of the money put. Now, the stock at 30, uh, you know, dropping the three points, our 30 strike put went up to 209. Okay, and we had about a once at the call. Of course, because we're at the shorter expiration, it essentially went to zero. We could maybe close it for one cent. Same thing over here with that kind of drop with a shorter term. So this gives us a gain of 98 cents or 87.5%. Okay, so this is the expectation that you'd expect to see. Okay, earlier we saw a losing straddle and strangle on Delta Airlines with the closest expiration. And what do we know about the straddle here on the left? It's going to have the highest cost. Okay, but what was interesting, because we started at the money, you have the highest cost, but we saw the lowest loss because it was right at the money, right? Percentage of monetary, we saw the lowest loss on this position because it was opened right at the money, even with only a move of 4% or so. When you have a 10% gain, you realize a very strong profit. However, if you get the type of movement that you're expecting, 10% or more, what happens with the strangle is you have a lower cost in, you make less monetarily, but you should expect to make more percentage-wise. But of course, if it doesn't move at all, we saw the largest loss. It was 11 cents, remember, on the non-moving for the loss on the at-the-money straddle and 23 cent loss on the position as well for the strangle. Okay, so when you have the movement that you want, percentage-wise, your expectation is the strangle will perform better. Monetarily, you know, moneyness-wise, we can say the profit and loss on the straddle would be higher. And if there's no movement, because you use the at-the-money options, the straddle would be a lower loss than the strangle because you're seeing decay on two out-of-the-money options if you don't see the movement that you want as much. Okay? All right, now... The longer term, of course, positions for Alcoa would have been less profit. If we use that, oh, we use that January 31 straddle, it would have cost us 508, but the liquidation was only 520. Okay, so we, what did we not lose? We didn't lose a lot of time value because of an applied volatility crush. That's obvious if we went further out, but you also have a small profit. And the November 31st, I'm sorry, the November 18th standard November expiration would have had a gain, okay, but not as high as we would have seen with the shorter term. All right, so where are we, to, where are we going with this? Well, where I was going with this is the fact that if you have the movement you want, the closer in expiration is going to be more profitable. If you don't see the movement that you want, the closer expiration straddles or strangles are going to have the largest loss and you're not going to have the ability to really manage them without just essentially starting over from scratch with a new position, either on a different stock or trying to manage 
a position on that same security as well. Okay, so you need that movement. In general, we showed that the nearest term might not be good enough. You know, it, it risks the highest loss, but it does have the potential for the highest gain. But in general, I think that you want the mix between. In other words, when we're talking about the DAL position, the October 14th series, right after expiration, is looking at too big of a loss because we didn't see the movement we wanted to. Whereas we had more control and more management if we went a couple weeks past. Not necessarily a few months past, but a couple months past the expiration. So it's all dependent on what happens to the underlying security. But may, another factor that comes into play, which is pretty big, is the implied volatility. Now, we've been talking about Apple on other webinars in the past couple of weeks, and we've also been talking about it a little bit today. The example here we're going to look at Apple was selecting a strike price when we know that the earnings are coming out on October 25th is an, almost an extreme example of what I've seen. And we're going to go back to power options here to take a look at the effect of implied volatility and what you need to be concerned with going into a straddle or strangle for the earnings series, okay? All right, so let's go ahead now. Pull up power options. There we go. Now, I'm going to take a look at a chain for AAPL. And we're going to look, we know that earnings are coming up on October 25th, so we need to at least go to October 28th. Okay, but let's take a look at just a small chain, okay, for this Apple position. Now, these volatilities don't look that high. They do in a little bit. We're at the 0.31, the 0.35 range. Okay, and the stock right now is at 117.67. So I'm going to take a look in a moment at the 118 calls and puts, okay? For a potential straddle. But right now, our expiration for October 28th is around 0 0.3, 0 0.31. And let's take a look at the October 21st very quickly. Now, notice here that the at the monies are at 0 0.17 or 0 0.18, the implied volatility values. They're much lower. Okay, so that tells me right away that if I was going to open a series on October 28th, a straddle or strangle for Apple on October 28th, I should expect the implied volatility of those options after the earnings on October 25th to come back to more to this norm, to about 18% from where it is now at 30 or 35%. If I go to standard November expiration, they're still around 0 0.24, 0 0.25. Okay, so we know the effect of earnings. It's going to affect that implied volatility. Let's take a look right now at the custom spread tool. And we're going to plan, we're going to play a little bit. We're going to look at that potential October 28th straddle, at the money straddle for Apple using the 118 call, the high price of, let's call it 267. And our 118 put, we're going to put at 297. Okay, so let's add those in. 267 for our call. And 297 for our put. Oop, there we go. Okay, actually, let's change something here very quickly. Just one moment, folks. There we go. Okay, I just wanted to shift this a little bit so you can get a better view of the profit and loss chart. There we go. Okay, so our total investment will be 564. And we've got the 118 strike. And we're three days away. Our expiration we selected, October 28th, is three days after the earnings. Okay, so we should know that we we'll, might need a gap down to the 112 range or a gap up to the 123 range, six points one direction, six points the other direction, essentially five or six points the other direction, in order to realize a profit. And this is okay because it's about a five to six percent move. So let's say that we see an upper break even at 123.64. Let's say the stock goes to 124 on the 25th 
of October. I'm sorry, the 20, 24th. Okay, so let's say 124 above our break even on October 24th, right after the, I'm sorry, yeah, October 26th, thank you, right after the earnings, okay? Let's go ahead and plug that in. Now you see here, with that movement, it's about a little bit less than 7%, we might expect a small profit, okay? But that's using a volatility of 0.22. If it reverts back to that lower range of 0 0.18, and we can estimate this here, so if a 1026, day after it's at 124, moves up seven points, but our volatility goes to 0 0.018, well, we still might expect a small profit on the position, but it's going to be much lower. And if it drops even further than that, down to 0.15 or so, that could change the position also. But we're also so close, remember, to expiration that we're really just going to intrinsic value. Okay. Now, why did I want to show this particular series? Okay, Daniel says the audio cut out. According to what I'm seeing, the audio is still registering. Um, I'm seeing it go there as well. Uh, I mean, I'm seeing the audio be recording. So that means the recording's still working, but I'm not sure why um, that's going there. But again, we talked about planning in advance. We knew that the earnings for Apple were going to be around October 27th, October 25th or so. So if I went backwards and I said, hey, what would have happened if I look to open this October 28th series back on, let's say, September 19th or September 20th, the day after September expiration. Well, what I want to do is let's take a look at our 118 call. And I'm going to go to a tool here on Power Options called the Research Tool, but I'm going to go to Option Research. Anytime you look at the Research Tool for a call or the put, it shows you all of the data that we have for the call to put, but down below, you can see the implied volatility range versus the option bid from when the option was released. Okay, hold on one second here. Sorry, folks, I'm going to type to Daniel real quick. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I just had to address Daniel there because he's still not hearing any audio. John, John, uh, Jim, thank you. Uh, Mike, thank you. Okay. So, down here at the bottom, I have the option bid versus the implied volatility. And we see here it's at that 0.32 range. But by clicking this bar here and extending it down at the bottom, I can see the total range of this series for implied volatility over time since the option was released. Okay. And so even now that it's only at 0.32, we see when that option was first released, it was up to 0.24. Okay, I mean, it started at about 0.24 average range um, that's there. One second. To the, okay, sorry, I'm just answering Daniel real quick. All right, there you go. Okay, so we know that the implied volatility does sort of hover around this 0 0.2, 0 0.18 range, but now it's at 0 0.32. So we're really close on this position, okay? On the other side of it, let's take a look at the put option as well. And of course, this uh, 118 strike put is probably gonna be very similar as far as implied volatility goes. Now, just ignore this, it was just a glitch here, but it started at 0.19 when the option was released on September 8th and it gradually moved up. So again, the 0 0.32 range to the 0.29, we're going to expect it to go back to probably this even range of 0.18 or 0.19 after expiration. I'm sorry, after the earnings. But remember, since we're so close to expiration, we know these options are going to essentially just go right to intrinsic value. But we're talking about if we had looked three or four weeks ago, after September expiration, or maybe even before that, Let's say when these options were released on September 9th. Well, September 9th, Apple was in a much different situation. And you know, we talked about that uh, with the uh, Delta position going further back. All right. So let's go to the chain again for Apple very quickly. And let's go back historically to around September 9th or September, let's go September 12th, right after these October 28th series were released. 
So the stock was at 105. Well, that's a much different scenario, isn't it? Okay, so in this case, well, it just jumped up $2.24, of course, but in this case, now I might be thinking, okay, we're a little bit to October expiration, 46 days. Okay, so we're about five or six weeks. Maybe we want to go a little bit closer in time, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to where we're only, I think, four weeks out. So 20 to 30 days, 46 days isn't bad. But we see here the 105 call had a good implied volatility of 0.26 or 0.24. This is important. So 45 days out, right after this series was released on October 9th, on October 12th, stocks at 105, the at the money call inputs have a delta, I'm sorry, have an implied volatility of around 0.26 45 days out. Let's now look and see what happens when we go one week in advance. We go to September 19th. Remember, the stock's at 105, just moved up a little bit. Let's go to the 19th for the October 28th expiration. Okay, and now we see the stock's moved up to 113, and we're still about the same range. Okay, and we have 39 days left. Let's go to October, no, I'm sorry, let's go to the next September after expiration, okay, let's go to the 26th. In this case, we're getting into, sorry folks, in this case, we're getting closer in time and the stock's still trading at 112. So what I did notice with these positions is let's go back to the 105. When the stock was trading at about 105, let's go to current for October 28th. Go. And I want to look at the, the 106, 105 call. Let's go to research and call research again. Now what we're looking at implied volatility here is a faster movement upwards. Okay? So there's two things to note about this going forward. And what I mean by that is that the two things I'm going to look for is in general it's best to look for positions when you're opening them for, for prior earnings date. We know it's coming out on the 25th, so when looking at Apple for the 28th expiration, we're probably looking at a better series, better entry point is probably going somewhere back where if we wanted to use the closest expiration October 28th, I would have wanted to get into that straddle or strangle probably around the 19th or so. Okay, so for the October 28th series, we're still about 39, 40 days left. Okay, so what I would look for is if I know earnings are coming out on a particular stock that I think is going to have a gap up, and I want to use the shortest expiration, I'm going to look for a position, I'm going to look to open that position probably somewhere in the range of 21 days to 35 days beforehand. Okay, three to four weeks as well. Okay, so that's one of the things we might tend to look for in that, that's what I would tend to look for. Why? Because as we get closer, if I bought this, the October Weekly 28th series, not including the movement in the stock, okay, here we are, September 19th, where the stock's at 113.58, okay? And if I look, let me just take the, we're going to take a look at the 114 call for October 28th expiration. Is that 114 call? Now, the stock, of course, has moved up as well. All right. So we're going to take a look here at our implied volatility shift. It's not a lot, but it opened at 0.24. And on the 22nd, we were talking about it the 23rd, it was at 0.26. And as we get closer to expiration, we've already moved up to about 0.33. Now, the stock has moved up as well from when we looked at the position. The reason I bring this up is because a couple questions came in during the presentation. I know there is a service out there, and there's a particular service that teaches strangles and straddles, and they teach buying 28 days or more, 28 to 35 days more before the earnings, which I encourage as well. But what they encourage is closing the position prior to the earnings release. So if you have a change, it implied volatility or the underlying stock that favored what you're looking for, 
to close it out beforehand. I don't necessarily agree with that. I opened this position because my expectation was a movement in one direction or the other. I'm planning on this earnings movement in one direction or the other. So closing early for a 10 or 12% gain on a $2 investment because the implied volatility increased, well, I took a profit, I gotta admit that, but I potentially missed out on more profit. Now, if the implied volatility really gapped up, if I had looked at a position on Apple where the implied volatility we opened at a 0.24 and it for whatever reason went up to 0.6 and I could close it out for a 40 or 50% gain just on implied volatility, I might do that. But in general, closing for a small gain and maybe only trying to play implied volatility to schedule it for that range might not be a good approach. I don't agree with it personally, okay? And I've never seen any statistics that, that works better because I'm playing a straddle or strangle to go forward and to look for that 10, 15% movement in a stock price to profit on the movement, not playing an implied volatility game, okay? And of course, the other advantage we talked about, I mean, buying something that's three to four weeks to go, okay, in the sense of Apple, if I'd open a straddle on September 20th or so for the October 28th expiration, I might have no fear of a large gap that caused me trouble. You could actually do adjustments against it using the weeklies for October 7th, October 14th, prior to the earnings. But of course, as we saw, Apple moved up a fair amount as well. All right. Now, let's go back here a moment and let's just review some of the things that we wanted to talk about. IV is important and you need to factor that into your equation. Okay, but the most important is the movement of the stock. If you look for positions, okay, in general, Ernie and I feel that you want to look for positions that are three to four weeks prior to the earnings event. And if you're expecting a big move based on either past earnings events and past swings in the earnings event, the closer expiration, the closest expiration after the earnings will give the highest return. Okay, that will result in the highest return going forward in that scenario. But you have to consider if the IV is doubled in others. If I looked at the Apple position and the October 28th series that we were reviewing, okay, had a volatility, oh shoot, sorry about that. Love when that happens, don't you? <laughs> there we go. Okay. All right, so we look for positions three to four weeks, I'm sorry, prior to the earnings. If you're expecting a big move, the closer in options will have the highest return. But if I looked at that Apple series and the implied volatility of the October 28th options were at say 0.6 or 0.5 and the November 18th was at 0.24 and today's the October 14th expiration was at 0.24, I'd have a big concern about using that series because I know my implied volatility is going to crush and I'd have to use the options calculator tool or that profit and loss chart to estimate what effect that volatility crush would have my position. Assume it's going to go back to the norm. Assume the worst case scenario in a volatility crush. Now, you may have the opposite. It can happen if I was looking at these October 28th series for Apple and the implied volatility was at 0.6. If Apple had terrible earnings and dropped down to 90 from where it is right now at 118, 119 or so, well, that might actually keep the volatility on the calls and puts up at 0.6 because of that massive decline and the massive fear now and the massive activity on the position. So you can't count on that all the time, okay? Um, but if the, you see an IV on the series you're selecting, it's double the others around it, and it's already increased in its range from when it was opened on the market, that might be a concern. You're definitely going to have to factor in what your expectation is of the stock movement versus how bad that implied volatility crush will hurt the position. And just in general, remember straddles will give you that lower break-even range, that closer break-even range when using at-the-money long straddle. And then rather than look for cheap strangles or avoid straddles because of the moneyness and because of the cost, right, the straddles will have a higher cost, but rather than compare that potentially to a cheap strangle, what you should evaluate a position 
looking at your stock going forward, if you're expecting a swing, you're expecting a pop, you just don't know the direction, but based on past earnings, you're expecting movement 10%, 8%, one direction or the other, you should calculate the profit and loss on the position based on a monetary amount. So I'm comparing, an, let's say I'm comparing an apple straddle and an apple strangle, and I see the cost basis, maybe $5 for the October 28th at the money straddle versus $380 for the out of the money strangle. Well, I wouldn't look at it as one-to-one. -one. I'd look at it as, well, if I put $1,500 in, that means I could buy roughly three contracts of the straddle and maybe five contracts of the strangle. And then use the profit and loss chart on both values to say, hey, if this does move up 8 or 9% and I expect volatility, how much moneyness am I expecting on the strangle versus on the straddle? Which one best suits your goals and which one best suits your need? So that's how you should really do it. And by the way, we talked at the beginning of the presentation going forward that in general, if you try to set up a whole portfolio, let's say 70 or 80% of your portfolio, even 50% of your portfolio to trade straddles and strangles at earnings, I don't think you're going to see a reasonable profit long term. You're probably only going to have a 40% success rate on the ones that really move enough to give you a large return, and that might not counter the loss you take on the other 60%. That's been my discussion I've had with customers over the last 15 years who have done this continuously. So what I typically do in my portfolios, I have uh, my other strategies aside, but when we hit earnings season, I typically jump in about 10 or 15% of my portfolio value into straddle and strangle positions that match my goals. And again, the search criteria I look for is I'm looking for positions on power options where the straddle or strangle, where the earnings event is about three to four weeks out in time from when I open the position. If I'm doing a strangle, I'm probably not going more than 5% out of the money with the strike price of the out of the money strangle position because that means if I go 10% or 15% for the cheaper cost, I'm going to need to watch wider movement in order to see a profit on the position. And I will likely choose the expiration that is closest to the earnings event if and only if the implied volatility of those options, again, such as Apple, it's not there, but if the average implied volatility of the options surrounding Apple is around 0.2 or 0.21, and it happened, the October 28th series happened to have an IV at 0.5, I'm probably looking more at the November 4th series as opposed to the October 28th or maybe even the November 18th to avoid getting in that trap of a volatility crush, okay? Uh, Frank, I think you misunderstood uh, my comment. Frank said, so as you said before, if you're comfortable about direction, why not do puts and calls versus today's subject? No, no, no. I was saying after the earnings, Frank, as a management. So... I entered a straddle or strangle expecting a move, but I didn't know the direction. I'm expecting a move one direction or the other. I just don't know which direction. Okay, it's 8%, 10% move is what I'd have to expect to open a straddle or strangle on a position personally. Now, when I look at that, after the earnings come out, such as in Delta or such as in Fossil, after that event occurred, now I have to reevaluate the position. Taking into account what happened with earnings, if it was a slight disappointment or if it was just middle range or if the longer term expectation was still bullish based on the earnings, well, that's when I would look to manage the strangle I already had in place. Remember, I bought it out to January. So why did I leave both in place after the earnings and just manage the call side or the put side? Why did I leave both in place and not close one and just manage the call side? It's because over the past two months since August expiration, there have been cycles of bullishness and bearishness on fossils. So when I think it's bullish, I'm managing the call or doing calendar calls, and I'm kind of just leaving the put alone or I'm selling a further out of the money put against it. And if I'm bearish, then I might do a calendar put spread in that case, or uh, I may do a bear call spread. So I'm trading both legs to take down the cost of the entire spread, so I might be able to go into the October, I'm sorry, the November earnings on that fossil position as the example with half the cost I originally had in August, but still the potential of the stock to move 8 or 10% of earnings, and that could give me a very reasonable return because I don't necessarily right now have a direction on that. 
I don't have a bullish or bearish sentiment per se on fossil right now because it's still middling about, shown some good movement in the past few days, uh, past week or so, I should say, Frank, actually. But that's what I meant by direction. If I'm in a longer term series, longer term straddle or strangle, after the earnings event occurs, I reevaluate the position, but I may leave the call and put in place like I did in fossil because I didn't have an overall bearish sentiment for the next two months or an overall bearish sentiment for the next couple of months. I was looking honestly at just managing both legs to lower the whole cost of the position, head to November earnings in a couple of weeks with a lower cost into that spread, but still having the same strikes I had originally uh, when I opened it in August for the December expiration as well. All right, well, there are some other features that you can find on Power Options, some other educational resources you can find on both straddles and strangles. Uh, if you haven't done so already, you might want to take your 14-day free trial to Power Options. Just go to powerop.com. You can put in your first name, last name, and email address, and click the button to start my trial. This will give you 14-day access to Power Options. You won't need any credit card or billing information as well. Now, once you log on to Power Options, you'll be able to go into the Other Strategies tab and add in long straddles and long strangles. Okay, and we're going to show that very quickly here. Okay, so if I go into the Other Strategies tab, and I'm just going to take out some of these strategies here, the Custom Spreads, Long Collar, Iron Condor, and we're going to add in long straddle long strangle. Now, the reason why I point this out, if I go to long straddle, the main strategy tab for long straddle, you'll see there's a basic help page, but there's two recent articles here that Ernie's put together is that using earnings surprises for straddle buying and the long strangle example, this was a strangle actually on P, okay, for, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what is that? Talk called the music stuff. Why can't I think of it? Um, yeah, so he went ahead and he gives an explanation here, even though it's a wide range. But I wanted to just quickly do this here. All right, there we go. And so there's the link to this article. It's actually just a free and available online. And you can access that at any time on the position. And he walks through the settings that we use for the default search on Power Options, of course, for the straddle and strangle position as well as um, what I can do to access that and his discussion on those positions as well. So if we go into the search at any time for the straddles or for the strangles, you'll see here that there's a couple default screens that you can use based on the Bollinger Bands. As I scroll back up, if we go into the strangle now, and we go into the search, You've got the earnings surprise default search here. Oh, there's a good one. I don't know if it's a good one, but there you see the one for uh, the Avis position. Uh, First Solar, Silver Wheaton, uh, earnings coming up in 26 days, 12 days for AEM, uh, 13 days for First Solar, actually, uh, four days for Valiant Pharmaceuticals uh, for their earnings, and we've got 18 days for Avis as well. Okay, so you can access those searches on the trial, of course. You can just go in a long strangle and take a look at what we're showing there. And you can also take a look at the different straddle ones also. All right, well, that about sums up what I have. If you have any last-minute questions, of course, go ahead and send those in um, here to the using the chat window. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you do have. Okay, let's see here. All right. I'm sorry, folks. So Bill had asked a question earlier. I do apologize, Bill, that I didn't uh, see that there. Uh, Bill had asked, is that, isn't there a way to trade after hours regarding the fossil position? Um, there's some services that do offer that. The uh, um, I apologize. Trading after hours and after hour trading cycles. At the time, mine didn't, and it didn't in the account that I supported. Okay, so it was more of a retirement Keo account, and the straddle that I had in place in the Keo account didn't offer the after-hours trading. Um, the cash account I have does, but I didn't actually for some security breaks. There, there's certain securities that are allowed and some that aren't, and unfortunately, Fossil at the time didn't. So there's nothing I could have done in my accounts or at that situation. You should check with your broker to see what's available as far as ETF or indexes or after-hours trading as well.
Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't see any other questions coming in. I want to thank you for joining me today. I do apologize for those of you that had registered originally, and this got pushed back once or twice. Um, <laughs> The first time this was webinar was supposed to be presented, there was a technology issue. Um, we had a poor connection, and sounds and everything else was going to drop out uh, fantastic. And it was just going to drop out, and it was never going to be done. And then on Wednesday, I don't think everyone wanted to hear me go through this webinar between coughs, sneezes, snorting, because I had a bad cold that <laughs> went away. Um, so in that case, uh, we apologize for delaying it the past couple of days, but I'm glad you all were here today to join us for this presentation. Remember, today at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we're going to have our open discussion Q&A session. You likely received an email where you can register for that presentation. Uh, regarding the open discussion, I don't have any planned material. We just field the question that comes that come in, excuse me, on the fly uh, and take those. And that's every Friday at 4.30 p.m. You can register for that by using the link in the email you received earlier or just any Friday you'll be able to join us. Just go to powerup.com. You'll be able to find the webinars link and you'll see the next series coming up. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. I hope to see you all in the near future and of course see you online. Take care everyone. Happy trading. Good night.